there, everybody. I'm Terry Kevlin, working here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center for about seven years or so. And today I'm going to talk about rain gardens and how great rain gardens are in the fact that there's no magic to actually building a rain garden, but they do a lot of magic in what they, how they treat water that is running off your property. <clears throat> so a rain garden is nothing more than a small basin that's filled with enriched and loosened soil that you're going to plant with small water-loving trees, bushes, shrubs, flowers, preferable natives, uh, which captures the stormwater to maximize infiltration of the water and minimize the, minimize the runoff that you get from a rain event. And it is, the magic of it is that it is a living water treatment system. The soil is one of the best natural filters that we have, and so pollutants that come off roofs and roads and <clears throat> uh, chemicals that wash off yards can all be caught and filtered before the water reaches lakes, ponds, and rivers. And you can take it from what looks like uh, a river or a pond into this wonderful oasis of plants. And face it, uh, stormwater leaving your property can become a flooded basement in your neighbor's yard. And as Nashville becomes more saturated with hard surfaces from buildings, parking lots, driveways, sidewalks, the more stormwater runoff becomes a problem. And helping to recharge the local water table through rain gardens is a really easy way for you to become part of the solution to eliminating flooding, and cleaning up our waterways. Where should you have one? Well, if every downspout led to a rain garden, the number of rain-flooded streets in Nashville would very likely vanish. So wherever you've got water sheeting across your property or where you're pumping it out onto your property, that's a location for a rain garden. And what's great about them is they don't have to be just functional. You can create an aesthetic adventure garden that captures rainwater and creates habitat for pollinators and provides shade and food for wildlife. It can include outdoor art or other, you know, large rocks, features of interest. And it can be in full sun or partial to shade because you're in charge of choosing what plants you're going to put into that garden. And for me, no matter what, any rain garden is a good rain garden because all of them have an impact, no matter how big, how small, or what you have going into it. So during a hard rain, this is a previous yard of mine in Inglewood, during a hard rain, watch where the water enters, crosses, and leaves your property to determine then what your goals are and the location of the greatest impact for that rain garden. So is there a river running through it? Do you suddenly develop a pond? Where is the water flowing from and pooling? How much do you want to catch? How much effort do you want to expend? How much work area do you have to work in? And how much money do you want to invest? Remember I said any rain garden is a good rain garden? Well, these are all things that you need to consider for how large yours is going to be. So I'm going to give you some numbers to be able to help calculate. It's not going to be a completely engineered calculation, but I'm going to get you really close to an optimal size. So here's our rule of thumb. One, Nashville has clay to loamy clay soil with a lot of rock, so it does not drain very well. Clay soil indicates a need for about 30% of the catchment area, which is all of your hard surfaces that doesn't actually absorb water. Rain garden's target depth for optimal rain garden in a clay soil is about 18 to 12 inches, somewhere in that range. Now, I will admit that at least the Cumberland River Compact has done a lot of rain gardens, and many of those are only about six inches deep. Any rain garden is a good rain garden, but you're not going to catch and hold a lot of water if it's only six inches deep. So that's up to you. Remember that utilities are buried 18 to 24 inches, so be sure to call 811 before you start digging. 
And most rainfalls in the Nashville area are only one to one and a half inches. I know it seems like a lot more than that because, well, that's because there's a lot of hard surfaces not absorbing that water, so there's a lot of runoff. And make sure you keep your rain gardens um, 10 feet from your foundation because you can end up with water intrusion if you get them any closer and you don't have your slopes right. And rain gardens need to have, it's not just the dugout part, but there needs to be a, a layer on the top that's about three to five inches of open space for the water to pool in. So let's figure out exactly how big things need to be. There are three things you need to know to get an optimal rain garden, and that is how much rain do you get in an event, how deep you're going to make your garden, and then what is your drainage area, and then back that off to about 30% of that drainage area or catchment area. So we already know two of those things. We know that most rainfall events in Nashville are one inch or less. I'm sorry, two inches or less. Your grain garden for an optimal in this clay soil is going to be about 12 inches. So let's put those into our equation. So a one inch rainfall, a 12 inch garden depth. And we're going to say that your roof and your sidewalks and your driveways and all those things that are hard surfaces that are not absorbing water is about 3,000 square feet. I like that number because that means 30% of it is just 1,000 square feet. So now you do your math, the one inch times 1,000 square feet divided by your 12 inches, and now you've got 83 square feet, which is about a nine by nine rain garden. That seems pretty manageable. And it's going to be three cubic yards of stuff that you're going to be moving around somehow. Even if you're putting some of it back in, you're going to be moving that dirt out to get it loosened up. So, how about that? If you're only going to fill your rain garden back up so that there's still three inches of pooling area, then that means you only need three quarters of fill going back in, which happens to be about two and a half cubic yards of fill, which magically matches almost exactly what two scoops of fill material is from us, whether it's different products we can talk about here in a little bit. But now you've got your, your basic measurement of how to figure out how big it needs to be. You're going to need to get water in and out of the rain garden because it's you're not going to big, dig a hole big enough to hold all the rain that you get. So there's going to need to be an outflow as well as an intake. And you can get it there several different ways. You can just let uh, place it down from a gutter and have the sheeting action just sort of fill up the whole place. You can use pipes. You can use uh, channels to be able to channel that water, whether it's through stone and brick or through pipe and pop-up valves, which I inherited at my last house, which works really well to get it away from the house but then into a targeted area. Um, the burying the pipe is just going to take a little more effort, but it can give you a really clean view as well. So it's up to you on what combination of things you might like to use. If you're on a slope, whether it is a dramatic slope, like the left-hand picture, or a gentle slope, like the upper picture, that's going to determine how water moves and how quickly it moves across the surface of your rain garden. So you may have to create a shallow, gentle slope to move water if you're in a, in a flat or flatter area. That's okay. That's called a swale in uh, terms as far as rain gardens are concerned. You can make a, a gentle vegetative swale. You can use that rock or rot resistant, resistant wood to move water there. Just make sure that it's about... 10 to 18 inches wide, at that point, you can have it run as far as you want it to do, but you're going to need it big enough to be able to capture and move it within the confines of your channel. The slope needs to be 
at least two inches, but not more than eight inches. And you say, my God, how am I going to figure out how big a slope is? Well, I have a handy thing on my phone called a bubble level that will allow you to put down a, a board or something and set my phone on it so I can tell how big of a slope I'm working with. But you can also use a calculator with this. So you're going to take the length or how big you're going to want the width of your rain garden to be. You're going to figure out from the lowest point up to a level string what that height is. And then you're simply going to multiply that times 100, and that's going to give you your slope. So if my string level is I'm going to build a gigantic rain garden that's 15 feet long or 15 feet wide, and I've only got 8 inches of a drop, Okay, easy math once again, time 100, that gives me a 5% slope. So that's right within the range that's going to be great to gently let that water get in there. If it's a greater slope like what you saw on the left-hand picture, you can see in the little inset that that's two pipes that are being fed from up the hill because it needed to be a flatter entry to the rain garden that I built. So, let's dig a hole. What are you going to need? Honestly, you should have just about everything you need already in your shed for your tools. You're going to need a shovel, a digging fork, which if you aren't familiar with that term, it's the uh, picture there to your right, uh, a wheelbarrow to move things around, possibly or a pick or a mattock uh, to be able to help break up and wedge out rocks that you are likely to find. In fact, at least in one of my yards before, I needed a, a rock bar to be able to really pry the big ones out. I can tell you if you get into a rock area that the rock is bitter, bigger than about a 12 by 12 space, scoot over because that rock is very likely to be much larger than the hood of your car and you just have hit the tip of it. So beware. You're also going to need some string or some hose and marking paint to be able to lay out the design of your uh, garden. And I always say marking paint because you can mark it off really easily, but that string and other things gets in your way later on. And using marking paint just makes it, uh, no matter when you come back to your project, the layout's still going to be there for you. Tape measure, so you can determine the height and width of your berm and the area measurements of your, of your basin. And the amount of fill you're going to need. You can use some of the good soil that's already there, but if a lot of it is clay, we've got better ways for you to use that. Um, having a string or laser level to make sure the top of your berm all the way around the basin part of it is level is also going to be important. So the inlet is going to have to be lower than any kind of drain pipe that you put to the edge of the basin, okay? So you can't have it level. The basin's going to have to be a little bit lower than where the water's coming in at so that it pools. The outlet is going to have to be lower than the inlet. You're going to want it to make sure that when your basin fills up, that eventually it has a place to get out. So remember, you're going to be sort of on a slope, very likely. Um, and I recommend that before you get started, that you have everything you need in advance. So if you're going to use fill material, if you're going to have swale material or rocks or pipe or landscape fabric, any of those things, make sure you've got that at the house because you may rock through this a lot quicker than you thought. And... You're not going to want to get on a Sunday and find that the places that you need to get those materials aren't open. So in that getting digging, you're also going to remember that if you don't keep those sides at about a 60 degree angle, they are going to, sorry, about a 30 degree angle, they're going to start sloping in, slumping in and, and fall into your pool. So keep those at a good stiff angle on the sides. You'll see that all the pictures that I've shown so far show that the bottom of the basin is level. 
And the reason it's level is that that means that every place has an equal opportunity to do that infiltration of water. And you want to give it as much area as possible so that it all disperses and it doesn't get soggy in just one spot. And remember, when you dig that out, you're going to be in the bottom of that hole a good bit. You're going to have compacted that soil. When you start going back to fill it back in, make sure you use your garden rake or that pick or mattock to loosen up that soil in the bottom so that you get as much infiltration points as you can. So there's the string. Once you set the string and you can move that lovely string all over everywhere so that you can, everyone in the family can agree on what the size is and what the location is and what the shape is. But once you get it set, that's when you get out your marking paint and put that down so that as you start getting into the digging mode, you're not going to pick that string up and move it all over everywhere with mud and shovel and shoes. Terry? Yeah. Uh, we have a quick question sure. here. Uh, we have an area that pools water where we want to build a raised bed. Is this a bad idea to put a raised veggie flower bed on top of gravel used to help with drainage there? Hmm. Um, actually, that would be a place that I probably would have because it's already, uh, water's already pooling there, so it should slow down how much you have to water. The challenge is going to be that you, if it's already pooling water, you can rot the members out on your raised bed. So it depends on how you're going to raise it. If you're using lumber or something like that, you're going to run into rot a lot quicker. If you were to use a cinder block or stone as the base for your raised bed, you'd probably be fine. Okay. Um, and remember, I said you're going to be moving about three cubic yards of dirt. Well, you're going to have to put it somewhere. I have always used mine as the back side of the berm. So you're going to build a berm all the way around because I've always used kind of a, a kidney shape on my uh, rain gardens because that allows a good sheeting action or other entryway to get maximum flow in, but then it allows it to hold it longer so it infiltrates uh, more thoroughly. So especially if it's that heavy clay that we've got, that's a great thing to use for a berm because it's not going to be infiltrating anything, which means the water is going to stay in your grain garden for a longer period of time. <clears throat> so once you've got your basin built, you've got your berm, you're then going to have to make sure that your water is going to get into that location. So dig your big hole first, then trench to it if you need to trench to it with a submerged pipe or a French drain or however it is if you want a targeted entry for your water to get there. Just remember about the slope, that it's over eight degrees and it's going to be a little bit tricky for keeping water not eroding. <clears throat> so dig that outlet for your overflow last. So you're going to level up your berm all the way around, but then on the back side, you're going to need some way for that overflow water to get out without naturally eroding it because that's the low point. Give it a place to go, whether you use vegetation that's going to hang on with deep roots or not, or you use rock or slate or something to make sure that it's got an ex exit point. You can use that, do that with a pipe if you want to get it out uh, and go to a specific spot instead of just a general overflow. Uh, the one thing to remember about that, that, that the outlet has to be lower than the inlet. Two to three inches is a good rule of thumb. And you're thinking, well, how is it ever going to hold water? You're going to leave a three to five inch pooling area before you get to that outlet flow. Um, okay. Now that you've got it all dug out, you've got your berm built, now you can use any good dirt that was in that yard or that area to put back into the basin. But you can also, and you can mix that with compost or uh, well-draining material like our landscape uh, or our garden product. 
which is what I've always used in, in mine, um, and then top that with about three inches of mulch. And that is not any special mulch other than it matches the rest of your landscaping plan. Um, I like uh, the pine fines just because it helps break down uh, a little more quickly, and that means it's enriching and adding composted nutrients in as it sits there. <clears throat> the actual bed itself is going to be a slight depression because it's going to get more water, heavier, longer in the middle. And that's what you want because that's where your wettest zone is, and that's where you're going to want to put um, things that in fact, that area could hold water up to 48 hours, and that's okay. That means you've got a good rain garden. Um, emergent plants, which are those plants that are like on the inside of the edge of the waterways, like creeks and rivers and things, that can stand to be up in water for a long time. Um, ferns, water-loving uh, shrubs, native shrubs. I, I know that a button bush will tolerate being in four feet of water. So that's just one example of a native I know specifically will go into that space. Then the slope sides, that sort of uh, lighter green area in that picture right there, is sort of, it's going to be drier in that it's only going to hold water for about 24 hours. So it's going to be something that's going to be able to tolerate wet to damp soil all the time, but isn't going to need as much watering during the dry season. So deciduous shrubs, ferns, grasses, that sort of thing on the outside. And then the lightest area up on the very top, that bermed area, basically should never flood if the overflow outlet's in the right place. Uh, and that's where your riparian plants that are all on the outside edge of creeks are going to do really well. So any drought-tolerant perennial, uh, self-seeding annual, anything like that can go around that top berm if you like it to. <clears throat> natives. Why in the world would you want to go with natives? Well, Joy has already talked to you twice, 101 and 201 on native plants. And here's just a great picture of what the difference is between grasses and other things and native plants. On the far left of your screen is just a regular fescue grass in its root system. Everything to the right of there are natives that have root systems that can go up to 10 feet deep, depending on what it is you've got. That's going to not only hold soil, it's going to help uh, with the pollutant filtration. It's going to absorb water. It's just... Natives are definitely the way to go, also as far as lack of having to maintain them greatly. So really consider those when you start looking at it. We've got all of our landscape specialists here will gladly help you pick out what native is best going to suit your scheme, your plan, your image of what you want your rain garden to look like. But the Cumberland River Compact has a really good website and manual on doing uh, rain gardens. In fact, they are a wealth of information. And these are two different plans that they have put out there uh, just for a 10 by 20 sun garden and a 10 by 20 partial sun to shade garden. So there are many of those same things that you're going to see that, that we keep on a regular basis here at Bates to be able to help you decide what suits your taste and your plan. So you can have before and afters that are from dramatic to casual. It's up to you to decide how you're going to take the time to transform your space into one of water retention, which is not always what you think you want to hear. Uh, but it's, it's up for you. Any rain garden is a good rain garden. It's time for you to get cracking. Thank you. We have questions? Uh, Kate says, that was the Cumberland River what? Compact. Down by the stadium. In the bridge building. And can you expound upon them again? Oh, yeah. The Cumberland River Compact is a nonprofit organization that helps um, maintain and 
better our water systems and watershed systems in the Middle Tennessee area. They have been there for years. They're the ones that put on the uh, dragon boat races in September every year as one of their major uh, fundraisers. And they are a great organization. They are worth looking into, and they have a lot of good information. Do they also not help uh, get the subsidized rain barrels? Yes, as a matter of fact, they do. Yeah. Uh, they subsidize them, and they've got a good article on how to build your own rain barrel. Um, what I will tell you, as great as it is, the outlet, the overflow outlet on most of the rain barrels I've seen don't have a big enough port on them. So you don't want to use a three-quarter inch um, regular hose. That's not going to get enough. You're going to have a lot of water overflowing right by your house. Uh, go to the plumbing section and get a like a, a pipe that has about, a flexible pipe that has about an inch to an inch and a quarter opening and you'll be fine. Okay, uh, let's see. Jill, uh, Jill is saying um, water pools in my yard and is dammed by the driveway. Sometimes water stands for, well, let me scroll back up here. Sometimes water stands for two or three days. The, oh pipe, the pipe under the driveway drains some, but the middle of the yard must be lower. If the area does not drain readily, is this a good location for a rain garden? Not really. What you would want to do is try to encourage that to go someplace. What you've got is a whole lot of, if it's right by the driveway, it's got a lot of fill, it's a lot of clay, a lot of rock, and probably a lot of rubble from your house um, that is, leaves it nowhere to infiltrate. If you were to really excavate that area, you may get down to below that rubble area, but you are looking for water. If you were to dig a 12-inch a deep hole and fill it up with water and let it drain out over time just so that the water is, the soil is saturated, then fill that back up again, it should drain in a day. If it doesn't, that is not a really good spot. You're going to have to dig a lot deeper to get past all the clay and the rubble. Which is why you talk about adding amended and exactly. loose fill back in. Yeah, I've I've never been successful with just because I lose so much volume by taking the rock and the clay out. I've always backfilled. And the last one I did was with just straight garden soil from here. And it has worked out really well. All right. Um, Kate says, I have an underground natural spring that causes a wet area. Will a rain garden work there? Yes. Sorry if I got too loud there. No, um, <laughs> we like your enthusiasm. <laughs> yes. Um, what you do is you just are be very careful about what plants you pick. I would actually um, not go very deep on that just because you don't want to get all the way into the spring. But that's the sort of place that the right positioned... Even trees, you know, willows or uh, sycamores or other water-loving trees or water-loving plants like your red tick twig dogwood or button bushes, those things that like a lot of water, that would be, one, I think it would be good for that space for the, the plants, but I think that you would find that they would flourish in that area. So you would... If it's full sun, just let our folks know it's full sun, but you're looking for things that are going to do well in a naturally wet area. Uh, Laura says, you mentioned not putting a rain garden near the foundation of a house, but do you have ideas for planting along the sides of a house where gutters cannot be installed? Maybe like a miniature one? Um. Yes, what you have to do, um, let me go back a couple of spots. Can they still see the slides? Uh, one moment, I'll swap back over. Okay, because let me get back to, oh, there it was. Um, I had a problem where the, the water slope was coming straight at my house, and they had gutters that, of course, were broken before I got there, so it was a real mess. But what I did was I built up towards the house so it sloped a little bit more away from the house and then I built 
a French drain to direct that water away. Well, if you do that so that you've got water that's not pooling by the house with a French drain, but then you can plant in front of that, then I don't see there would be a problem. You just don't want water standing there, but you can certainly plant there with um, plants that you've enriched the soil enough that it soaks in and doesn't just run down your foundation. So what 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 we're seeing along your sidewalk? Yes, is that the French drain that you're talking about that's right, in there? Right, right by that sidewalk because the water was just sheeting across the sidewalk down to the foundation of the house, and I have a basement. Mm -hmm. It's a problem on mm -hmm. top of a problem. So I simply shortcut that water to keep it from sheeting past, but then the plants that I've got in behind that are all natives, and I backfilled all of that with, uh, actually all of that was with garden as well. I'm a big fan of garden. <laughs> Yeah, it's got a, a ton of amendments in it that, that yes, make, it does. It, make it light enough. And, and that was right next to the house, which meant that there were huge rocks and it was clay that I could have supplied a, a pottery factory with the clay that was in there because <laughs> I had to have a backhoe come in to dig it out. It was so badly clayed. So that, that, was, that allowed it so that it didn't go slide across that clay into the foundation of the house, it short stopped in front of that area, and then I made sure that I directed any extra water off in front of the house. So we're looking at a huge natural sponge right there. Yes. And then the French drain that's along the sidewalk there, it is sloped, I guess. It slopes going... down uh, past the front of the house into, I got a lot of hills in my area, uh, out past the house down into two more receiving rain gardens on the, the bottom side of the hill. Wonderful. Uh, and then the improvement in the moisture in your basement? I've actually been able to now go in there and paint the block and it doesn't spald or peel off anymore. That's because awesome. we I got it dried out. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um Lois Sabino is asking, what is a French drain? Ah, a French drain is um, a structure where you, I'll explain how I did it anyway. Um, I dug a ditch. I made sure that I had it low enough that I wanted at least three inches of gravel to sit on the top. In this case, it's supposed to look like a little, you know, creek because it does when it really rains. And uh, you dig it out so that you can put a four-inch corrugated and perforated pipe in there to help direct water when it hits those rocks. It's going to immediately infiltrate very quickly into the pipe and get carried away. What you have to do is backfill that area with rocks so that it all hits that pipe and travels quickly away instead of sitting on the dirt. And you have to make sure you line that with landscape fabric so that you don't allow the rocks to become um, submerged into the soil. You want it to be a, a little drainage pipe. It's just, it's an attractive drainage pipe that you can't even tell it's there. In fact, let me switch over. Whoops, sorry. Let me go back a couple. That little pop-up valve that you see, it's a little round dewy. It's a product by NDS, and that fits onto a corrugated pipe so that you can run the pipe under the ground and have it pop up on top of the ground whenever it rains, and otherwise it closes it so... Critters can't get inside your pipes. And then the, the drain exhibited uh, to the far right there. Oop, sorry. Yes. On that slide. Uh, that allows for debris to settle in the bottom, right? And right. then it, it fills up and then the water drains out. Correct. Yep. So it's like a, a French drain is just something that's going to take a lot. It's a lot further. Um, as far as a, a method of moving it, it's an encouragement as opposed to a, 
shake my finger, you've got to move this direction. So a, a catch basin with a, a, a solid pipe is going to catch all the water, not give it any choice except go rushing down this thing as fast as it comes in, in a corrugated pipe, slows it down because of the ridges, and that sort of that little trench of rock that you've now built helps give a lot more of it, but encourages it to go in a direction. And it helps really keep it away from your foundation. Now, Terry, I, I, I wonder if you've noticed this as well, but uh, just driving around Nashville, I've been seeing a lot more incorporation of rain gardens in shopping centers. That's a requirement. It is That's now. because Metro planning is uh, new construction because we are being so permeated with hard surfaces. Um, you'll see even across the street from us here, that Great House has put in an outstanding installation. Oh, that it's huge. It, it is huge, and that's because it has to catch the storm water that is coming off their property to keep it from getting out into the, the general area. So there is a requirement by Metro Codes that they have a certain amount of storm water capture so that it does not continue to overburden our storm sewers and our lakes and streams. And, you know, it, it has had a, a really great boon uh, to hosting wild, a little wildlife refuge, too. I've seen birds in the Absolutely. trees that they planted in there. Um, but it, I, was, I brought that up because it, it might be good to observe these. You know, they're, they're just in the parking lots where you pull in and get some ideas Absolutely. for your own rain garden from the way that these are planted, the type of plants, the way that things are laid out. Um, McCabe Park has a that's over in the West End area <clears throat> has a really good rain garden. I know that Cheekwood has a really good, not just a good one, but also a good explanation of how they put it together and what all they've got planted and the functions of a rain garden. So there are many, many more places around that are doing it. One because uh, Metro is either requiring or encouraging them to do it. And there are a lot more um, leadership in engineering, uh, environmental design, lead uh, housing that are also incorporating rain gardens as part of their design. Okay, we got a question here. Uh, <clears throat> which do you recommend? Digging down 12 inches, then laying gravel and landscape fabric under the raised bed, or is depth oh. not required? It may attract the pool to stay under the bed. Uh, the landscape fabric is certainly going to keep down, keep the uh, rock from becoming incorporated in the soil, which is a rule. If you're, you're putting down gravel, it's because you need that gravel buffer. Um, and I think I would, I would do, if this is at the place where it's just pooling and it's not the natural spring area, I would say, even though you want to do a raised bed, I would do some some digging down, even if it's in a targeted spot, to try to get some areas that you can get some natural infiltration. My guess is there's heavy clay right there or stone that's not allowing it to drain. And if you will give it some pilot holes to be able to drain into... If you want to fill those up with stone, that way you know it's going to be going down into those holes. That would be great. Um, <clears throat> so that that would probably be what I would do, and then build your bed up from there. I don't know that I would put it on rock, because if you put it on rock, you're going to have your soil out of your raised bed filter through the rock. If you put landscape fabric underneath your bed you're going to be you got to be careful to not turn it into a swimming pool i had some neighbors that said a little landscape fabric is good a lot of landscape fabric will keep me from having to worry about weeds mm -hmm. and they ended up with water overflowing their bed because it couldn't filter through the landscape fabric that they put out 
So something to consider. Accidental uh, fountain, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, it does a great job to keep things segregated that need to be segregated, but you can run into like like double layering or things like that to make sure that it doesn't it's got some water's got to go somewhere it's either got to go into the earth or it's got to come out the cracks in the raised bed all right well that seems to be the last bit of questions there all righty uh i'm just gonna go ahead and say we had a last minute scheduling <laughs> conflict yesterday with the way this webinar was scheduled um, we have another one that's coming up. It's actually by Terry, uh, Composting 101. Definitely stay tuned for that one. Um, it was previously on March 1st. We've now moved it to March 2nd, and then we'll probably have to move container gardening across the season. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up if you're going to be attending the next one, that that, that will be a change. So plan for that. Um, aside right. from that, take it away, Terry. We're... <laughs> We're done. We, we are good to go. If you have any questions, you know, we're here seven, six days a week right now. And just about anybody can help you, certainly with picking out the right plants. And they, the landscape specialist may be able to give you a little more guidance on your wet spot that stays wet. It's definitely going to be a, a plant choice. And getting some pilot holes, I really do think, would help you a lot there. All right. Thank you.